So, um, I really want to thank you for coming. Uh, I know uh, most people have had a hard day of uh, work, and this comes on top of that, and I really appreciate um, the invitation, and I also appreciate your coming to hear me. And I definitely want to thank uh, Juan for making this happen. And um, as researchers and activists, our work depends on the accomplishment of others, and it's important that we acknowledge the work of others on which our own work depends. My work would not be possible without activism and scholarship done by other critical scholars, and I'd like us to give you all a shout out for doing work that has supported the growth of a social movement to defend public education, starting with your own university. that um, when I teach a class, I usually say, um, teachers usually say, turn off your cell phones. When I talk to people, I say, turn on your cell phones and turn off the radio. Because I want you to tweet and post on Facebook everything that's going on now. I think and you'll understand in my presentation, I think, why this is so important. We in the United States, in fact in most of the world, are not presented with the information that we need to really make informed decisions about public education. And the one place that we can get that information is social media. It really is a critical part of building a movement. So, turn on your phones, turn off the rigors, let's tweet, and let's post on Facebook. I'm serious. I'm serious. Let's do it. Let's do it. That's part of building this movement. It really is very, very important. We're not going to get into the mainstream media unless we take over, unless we have a presence in the social media. That's one of the lessons that we've learned. That's one of the lessons from the Chicago Teachers Union. They said uh, they became the media. They became the media. And I think that that has to be our stance as well. I hope that when I finish my remarks, you'll have a clear understanding of what's behind these attacks on teachers and public education, and what we should be doing about it, especially the role of teachers in this. But first, we need to take a step backward and recall what preceded this astounding scapegoating of teachers and schools for all of society's ills. I think we need to look honestly and talk honestly about schools at an earlier time. And I do that by thinking about my own education at Harlan, David W. Harlan Elementary School in Wilmington, Delaware. It was a city school. Wilmington is the largest city in the state of Delaware. In first grade, though, I had recess three times a day. I could buy a healthy lunch prepared by cafeteria workers who were employed by the WPS, Wilmington Public School System. I took music lessons for free. <clears throat> violin. On a violin, the city schools lent to me. We had a school library. We had chorus. We had band, just in our school. There was also a city elementary school chorus, city elementary school band, city elementary school orchestra. We had art classes three times a week. However, the school, just a mile away from Harlan, got the leftover musical instruments, the teachers Harlan parents didn't want, and much less money for book supplies and maintaining school facilities, like the gym and the playground. Why? Harlan was all white, intentionally segregated. Real estate developers and brokers had homeowners sign racial covenants that prohibited the sale of the home to blacks. This information was used subsequently by the NAACP after I graduated from the Wilmington Public Schools in its successful suit to desegregate the school system. So as we now make sense of and resist the terrible things being done to public education, our profession and our students, we must acknowledge that there was no golden age to which we can return. 
to be credible to the parents and community members who should be our strongest allies, we must acknowledge the complicity of the educational establishment, teachers and teachers unions, education faculty as well, in allowing gross inequality to persist. I hope in the question and answer period that follows, someone will ask me how this relates to Diane Ravitch's analysis in her new book. Federal and state changes are done in the name of improving educational equality, and we have to acknowledge an ideological defeat. Many parents, citizens, even teachers, have been bamboozled by this rhetoric. But we know from what has occurred elsewhere in the world when these reforms were implemented, that they depress achievement and they increase racial and social inequality. Yet, to win minds and hearts, we have to brand our challenge to harmful initiatives with a painful acknowledgement of the past, along with the affirmation that we, and not powerful economic and political elites, have all children's interests at heart. My own knowledge of the extent of this project began in 2005 when I tracked down and read a report of the World Bank, which called teachers and teachers unions the greatest threat to global prosperity. Now, I want to tell you when I, when this was announced in 2005, people in the audience laughed. No one is laughing now because we understand, we are, we have experienced policies that are based on that premise. At that time in the United States, we had just begun to feel the effects of NCLB. And I myself questioned whether NCLB should be supported because there was much in the legislation that I advocated. For instance, the requirement to report test scores <coughs> by race. When I did research on the, New York, on the New York City public schools, I could not get data disaggregated by race. They did not release that data. And they did not do so because that data hid, it obscured, terrible inequalities within the New York City public school system. So, although I didn't trust the Republicans and I didn't trust the testing, Nonetheless, I was puzzled and disoriented by NCLB. However, as I read more about the education in developing nations, I realized that NCLB was the U.S. version of a project that had been imposed first on the global south, on developing nations, beginning with Latin America and specifically Chile, under the ruthless dictatorship of Pinochet, supported by the U.S. government. The research that I then began to do about the global project took, became the basis of a collection of es essays I edited with Mary Compton. Obviously, I cannot summarize this book and my new one in the time that I but I want to quickly review the assumptions of this project, as it is explained in documents, reports, and other materials widely available and shared among the elites who are setting education policy. You won't find this information in the New York Times, or the LA Times, or the Boston Globe, nor in popular media in this country, not even on MSNBC. But researchers have been aware of these developments for many years, as have been financial elites. I'm sometimes asked how this conspiracy could exist without our knowing about it. So the first thing I want to clear up is that this is not a conspiracy, because conspiracies are, by definition, secret. This is no secret. It's a project that has been discussed quite openly in the World Bank, in the International Monetary Fund, and in publications of global finance for more than four decades. And I have here, to give you a demonstration of that, just one quote from the Merrill Lynch Report of 1999. This is the new mindset. 
1999 from the Book of Knowledge Investing in the Growing Education and Training Industry. Education is a market. And they have adopted and are pushing on us a new mindset of schools as retail outlets. Schools as retail outlets, the disempowerment of school boards, which become no more than customer service departments. So the power to decide what is taught and how is taught was planned for years to be taken out of the realm of the public. This is no conspiracy. This is a project. The project aims, the project is, a work, is the work of a set of economic and political ideas and ideology referred to as neoliberalism in the rest of the world. It rests on these assumptions. The free market is the best regulator of services. We hear that all the time in this country, don't we, about free market. What we, we also hear that workers in every country must compete with those elsewhere for jobs. But what we do not hear in the United States that is absolutely factually accurate is that most jobs being created in the world require about an eighth grade education. It is true in the United States as well. And all you need to do is go to that revolutionary organization, the National Bureau of Labor Statistics, to find out what jobs are being created. They require about a seventh or eighth grade education. They are in the service sector. They are jobs like Walmart Associates. Walmart is the largest employer in the United States. You, you all know that, right? Think about Walmart Associates. So, if that's the kind of job that's being created, we don't need a highly educated workforce, do we? So, money spent on educating a workforce to be highly educated, that is, to go to college, to be prepared to go to college, or even to go to college, is, in their terms, wasted. It's a waste of scarce resources. And you know what? If you don't need a highly educated workforce, you don't need highly educated teachers. A professional teaching force is unnecessary and is an expensive waste of government spending. And that is straight from World Bank reports. Straight from World Bank. So let's think about next what the project aims to do to transform public education. And I want to say, I, I said, um, I gave this presentation a couple of years ago in uh, the UK, in London, at um, Annie Academy's Allow, uh, Alliance um, Convention. Academies are charter schools in the UK. So there was a, you know, community and a, a public meeting, conference about it. And I said, every country in the world, you know, we see this program in every country in the world. And afterwards, Stephen Ball, who's a, a very good researcher at the Institute of Education in London, came up to me privately. And he said, Lois, I, I didn't want to correct you in public, but it's not every country in the world. It's not Finland and North Korea. So let's just say, not every country in the world. Right? Not Finland and North Korea. Not Finland yet. There's a new government in Finland. Okay. So what are the goals? Number one, defunding public education. Defunding public education. You know, there are a lot of ways you can defund public education. One is you can cut the budget. The other is you can impose user fees or increase user fees. In higher ed, user, user fees are tuition. So increasing user fees in higher ed is a way of cutting back access to higher education. Remember what I said before about trying to have a synchronicity between the labor market and what education is doing? They don't want a lot of people to be highly educated because there aren't jobs for people who are highly educated. 
I know my daughter graduated from college a year and a half ago and she's living at home because she can't find a job. And I know about 40 parents <laughs> who are in the same situation of supporting children who can't find jobs that will pay enough and they have a good education. So, so much for Orrin Duncan's statement that education is the one true path out of poverty. It's not, that's not happening. So, what we have is defunding public education. Another part of the project is fragmenting school systems, creating alternative schools and alternative school networks. Um, Ken Saltman talks about this in his book, about he, he refers to this as creating a national system of privatized education. National system of privatized education. Charter schools fall into this. And also privatizing schools and school services, bringing in for-profit companies. Education is a huge market, and that's how they view it. Education is the last segment of the economy that was public that is not open for profit, for profit. So this is all about marketizing schools to create uh, a new a source of profit, profit. And then the other thing that's part of the project globally is using standardized tests to control what is taught. And that's a very important part of the project, as I'll, ex I'll uh, explain later, later. Uh, in part because there's an ideological component. When you, can have, when you have standardized testing, you control what's taught how it's taught, but when you have standardized testing and you connect the tests to teacher salaries, which was the neoliberal wet dream that they got in the last three years, it's been their dream. You, they've been, they have been like vouchers. They have just been, they've been fantasizing about getting this, and they got it. They got it because of the capitulation of the teachers unions. That's why they got it in this country. And they've gotten it elsewhere because the unions were too weak to resist. That's what that's the reform in Mexico that the Mexican teachers have just been contesting to link pay to the standardized test scores, right? So called merit pay. They want that because they want to be able to control teachers. It's very important to take away teachers' professional autonomy. It's very important to and lastly, they want to destroy teachers' unions. Now, you can ask, why do they want to destroy teachers' unions? They're so weak. They're so disoriented. This is the reason. Um, before I talk about that, um, I wanted to just say this quickly, that when I go through this information, um, and I do it really quickly, sometimes people want more information that I'm not providing in the presentation. And so I, I just, you know, this is a university and I want this presentation to, to give you more, um, more evidence than I would give when I make this presentation to audiences of parents and teacher activists. So I want to just talk to you about critically reading World Bank reports, critically reading these reports. Because remember what I said, the stuff is in there, but we have to read the reports critically. So in this latest World Bank report, Making Schools Work, if you, whenever you hear school autonomy and control of resources, we're going to give schools autonomy and we're going to give them control of resources, let's be clear that what, what are they talking about? Giving schools control of resources. User fees, tuition. Charging parents for things that used to be, that were free. Making parents pay for books. Making parents pay for uniforms. Making parents pay for school trips. Making parents supply paper. Making parents supply the money for an after school program. Making parents buy supplies for the chemistry lab. Even if you don't have tuition, which they want and they can't always get, you have user fees by making parents and students pay for things. How do you see this in higher education? You know all this stuff about going green? You know, that they want professors now, the, the push to make professors give you course materials that are um, electronic to just send you the PDF, right? 
Are you getting that more from professors? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not about going green because you have to print it out. That's about shifting the cost. That's about shifting the cost of printing from the institution to you. That's an increase in user fees, right? That's what it's all about, increase in user fees. Vouchers, charters, school-based budgeting, accompanying funding cuts. So they cut the budget and then they say, wow, but you have the right to spend the money in any way you want. And what that means is that principals are faced with, they can have one experienced teacher who's earning $70,000 a year, or they can have two new teachers who are earning $35,000 a year, and with those two new teachers, they bring down class size, right? And they don't have in a school, that funding of teacher salaries used to be, take, used to be a school system responsibility, but with school-based budgeting, it's pushed down to the school level. Okay. Making teachers more accountable. There's a, there are two chapters here about making teachers more accountable. What does that mean? Standardized tests control what is taught, and teachers are hired and fired at will. That's what is going on with all these teacher evaluation policies. The World Bank spells it out. They want teaching to be an occupation in which people will work two or three years it is eliminated as a profession. That's what, that's what explains the push against pensions, right? Push against pensions is to eliminate teaching as a career and as a profession. And they want the right of principals and administrators to hire and fire teachers at will. At will. So teachers essentially become contract labor. Okay, so let me talk here about why are teachers' unions dangerous. They don't appear dangerous to us, do they? Right? But what's dangerous about the teachers' unions? Well, they are. They are potentially the most powerful force blocking implementation of this program throughout the world. And that is why the World Bank referred to teachers in that report, the World Development Report, making services work for poor people. That is why the World Bank identified teachers and teachers' unions. They said they capture governments. In other words, teachers' unions <coughs> exercise institutional power. They're stable, and they have a steady source of income, far more so than social justice or advocacy groups. You're a parent activist, you graduate from activity when your child graduates, right? You're a teacher, you're still in the school when the parents and the kids have both left, but you're there. And so is the union, right? Even if teachers leave a school, the union remains. The union is a stable institutional force. Unions, whether they, whether they realize it or not, are projecting collective voice and power. Well, that whole idea of collective voice is an anathema to the neoliberal ideology of individualism, dog-eat-dog -dog competition. The whole idea of a union is that you work together, you speak in one voice, that's collective. And finally, and this is very important, even when they don't realize they're doing it, unions plant the idea, the seed of democracy in the school. They're saying that somebody else has a right to say what's going on here, aside from the administration. Schools are not retail outlets owned by the government or by a company. We have a right to have a say. That Unions plant that idea. However, all the things I just said that made unions potentially strong, all those same things create a lot of problems. And those are the problems that we're seeing right now. Those are, that's what we see. Unions have to serve all members, regardless of their beliefs. That's one thing that makes them strong, you know? 
solidarity and collective voice. But you know what? They have to also defend and listen to that crackpot down the hall. Right? That crackpot down the hall has a vote just the same as I do. Right? That's it. And you know what? That that means that we have to <coughs> listen and we have to arrive at consensus. Second of all, the institutional arrangements that give unions stability and strength also make the unions prone to bureaucracy and paternalism. That contract that protects you has a lot of legalistic language. And it can be hard to understand that language. And so the unions create Union staff or experts begin to interpret the contract for you, and pretty soon you're relying on them to tell you what your rights are under the contract, instead of your telling the union what your rights are under the contract. See? So it's a double-edged sword. Unions and union members finally Unions and union members are susceptible to prejudices that affect the society. Racism, sexism, homophobia, religious intolerance. They're in our society, and we carry the germs inside of all of us. Union members are human beings. Teachers are human beings. And so the union, those attitudes are present in the union, just the same as they're present in the society. Big, what a surprise, what a surprise. We live in a society, we live in a, a society that's unequal, and we bring those prejudices, we carry them with us in varying degrees, and we carry them with us to our union. And what that means is that those, pr those problems are present in union life, even though they contradict the union's principles of equality and solidarity. So what's my answer? Well, I wrote this book, I co-edited this book with Mary, The Global Assault on Teaching Teachers and Their Unions, that lays out the research that I've been talking to you about right now. And um, after I wrote the book, I thought, you know, I have to do something about my own union, my faculty union. So I helped form a caucus in my own <coughs> decrepit, terrible world. And it took us five years, but we one, and we have a new leadership that is progressive and wants to do right. And I think we, we helped mobilize adjunct faculty. That was really the core in what we did. We put together a coalition. But then, you know, after I wrote this book, I thought, wow, I have learned so much in my own union work. I think I need to write a different kind of book. And so I wrote the future of our schools. And if I were a good salesperson and capitalist, I would have copies of the book to sell to you, but I'm neither. I'm neither. What I have is I have some flyers of the book. It's Haymarket. And in the book, the book is, I think, a pretty readable book of advice that lays out what I've just talked about in more de detail. And also, I have nuts and bolts about what you can do as teachers or as parent activists to push, push against these problems that I've talked about and help transform the unions. So one of the things that I argue in the book, that I say in the book, is that there's a difference between a social justice union and a social movement union. In a social justice union, the, the union speaks to the union's goals and pushing for unions to stand up for social concerns beyond bread and butter, what we, what we talk about business unionism, right? In the book I explain we've got to get rid of this model of business unionism, where somebody does it for you, and where the staff are expert, where you say, where's the union? And, the, and um, I call for social movement unionism, which speaks to the union's organizational practices, and in particular, democracy. So you know what? It's, it's no good anymore to have a union where 10 people come to a meeting and they pass progressive re resolutions about the war in Afghanistan or 
global warming or gay rights. That's a social justice union. And you know, it's important, I think, that unions take progressive stands and ally ourselves with social, with social movements outside. But what's just as important, even more important, is that the union itself become a social movement. The unions themselves need to be transformed. When somebody says, where is the union, right? We have this administrator who's busting our chops. The school board is busting our chops and they say, where is the union? The answer is, we are the union. That's the answer. We are the union. We're the union. Nobody's going to do it for us. So what are the characteristics of a social justice union? Well, to me, a social movement union is a social justice union, but the first char characteristic is robust union democracy, even at the cost of leadership losing on social justice issues. I, union leaders, have to be prepared, for the reasons that I talked about before, to lose sometimes on social justice issues, that members are not going to follow you. Members are not going to necessarily agree about homophobia and gay coming out day. It's just, it may not happen. That's, but that's the price of democracy. The other thing is that we need to have respectful, mutually supportive alliances with parents, students, community, and advocacy groups on issues other than schooling. Unions always reach out to parents for support when there's a contract. But parents rightly are saying, well, what have you done for us? What are the social issues in the community? Are homes in foreclosure in your community? We can't ask for salary increases. We can't ask to maintain our pensions when parents are losing their houses without reaching out to support them in anti-foreclosure struggles, right? If kids are denied train passes, as they are in the Providence schools I found out, the union and teachers have to be advocating on behalf of the students. We have to do that to have, to have uh, uh, credibility with allies. It can't be a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours alliance. It really has to be building mutually respectful alliances where we listen to parents and we listen to community. We learn from and we learn with them. And in this regard, I'm going to say we cannot win, I don't think we can win the teacher evaluation issue without parent support. We're, we're not going to be able to win on that without parent support. We can't negotiate it in private. They're, we're not going to win that. They, we're, we're too weak. And so we need to find ways to have discussions with parents and with students about what should school look like. What do you want education to look like? What does good teaching look like from your point of view? And then we have to tell them what, as teachers, we think good teaching looks like. Which brings me to the last, the other thing I want to talk about, which is respectful, different discussion of pedagogical differences. Not all teachers think alike about what good pedagogy looks like. Just like all kids learn differently, <coughs> teaching is a human, up close personal activity and there are differences between us and we have to be respectful of that. At the same time there are certain things we can't allow. So it doesn't mean that everything goes but it means that there's a range of pedagogical practices that we can support and that's the discussion that we have to have among one another and with parents. And finally I think that social movement teachers unions need to have a critique of neoliberalism's global project. Why? This is a global project. Michael Gove, the minister of England, was in Boston today. Do you know that? He came yesterday to visit with Jed Bush. You know why he went yesterday? Because England's teachers were on strike. Really powerful strike. With enormous public support. He has a terrible black eye, terrible black eye. And so supposedly, he's come to the United States to learn from us. But really, what's going on 
is he is looking for the imprimatur, the approval of Arne Duncan and the Obama administration on these terrible things that he's, these terrible policies that he's imposing on English teachers, right? So this is a global project. It's a global project, and it requires a global resistance. And although in this country we often think of ourselves as leading the way, and in some ways we do, in some ways we do, in other respects we have a lot to learn from teachers in other countries who have resisted longer and frankly more effectively than we have. We have a lot to learn from them. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I follow this website, teachersolidarity.com. You should bookmark it. Mary Compton, the co-editor of my book, every day has a couple of news pieces about teacher struggles in the rest of the world. And I happen to see that um, teachers, pre-K teachers in Trinidad and Tobago were protesting the fact that they were moved from full-time permanent employment status by the government to being contract workers, working for agencies, you know, being sent out by agencies. I went into work and I mentioned this to the early childhood specialists in my college, and they said that's exactly what they did in the Newark, New Jersey public schools this year. Newark pre-K teachers had been part of the Newark Public Schools and had been regular teachers and now they shifted them and they get yearly contracts and they get paid at a different pay scale. Exactly the same, exactly. Now what if Newark teachers had reached out? Newark, Newark is overwhelming, the student population is overwhelmingly children of color. What if they had reached out to the teachers in Trinidad and Tobago? and sent messages of support and discussed, discussed the, 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 the shared project here, discuss what they were going to do. It's incredibly supportive when you're involved in a strike or you're involved in protests to know that people outside your community are supporting you. And it's a global project and we need global resistance. So, in my book, uh, which I don't have a copy of to sell you either, <laughs> in my book, in part one, I make a case for social movement unions, and the second part is collected articles from your politics. I want to end by saying that um, the crisis is not going to wait for us to get ourselves together, and that we really need a sense of crisis and a laser-like strategic focus. Our resources are limited, and we are in a life and death struggle. There are people who say we have to have a seat at the table. That's what we hear all the time from the teachers' unions. We have to have a seat at the table. And my answer to that is our opponents want to destroy our livelihoods, our organizations, and our ideals. How do you sit at the table and negotiate with people who want to kill you? How do you do that? How do you do that? I don't think you can do it. Not much you can negotiate when they want to kill you, right? Teachers in Chicago have shown the world, as they did more than a century ago, you know, teacher unionism was born there in the United States, the potential power of teachers when they form themselves into a social movement to defend public education. I think the CTU's report, The School of Chicago Students Deserve, points the way for other teachers' unions. It embeds teachers' need for job protections, a professional wage and working conditions, and a vision for public education that acknowledges the legacy of inequality in public education and names racism as a poison we must address. While we can learn from Chicago, every community, every school, every struggle is unique. There is no magic formula, no magic bullet. What we have to start with is our vision for education, our commitment to our profession and to our students, 
We need to demonstrate that it is we who stand up for children, not those who destroy public schools while saying that they are putting children first. I hope my presentation today and my book will be helpful in thinking through how you can do this. Thank you for the invitation, and now to your comments and questions. to be a conversation, and I, I cannot talk anymore. On the other hand, I know that there are people who really want me to say some stuff, right? So I think maybe a way to balance that is to take four or five comments or questions. It doesn't have to be a comment. Tweak to be a question. It can be a real comment. But let's keep it to about two or three minutes. Does that sound right? Uh, to try to compress it. And then after every four or five questions or comments, I'll jump in. Does that, does that sound okay with everybody? Okay. And maybe we'll, we don't need the microphone. I don't think we need the microphone. Okay. Don't be bashful. I love critique. Sure. Um, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, Stanley Ar Aronowitz yes. uh, came, and I, I asked him a question. Uh, I said, where, you know, where do you see the, the cracks in the system as far as um, you know, uh, as far as the opposition of those that are against teachers' unions, those that are against, you know. And he said, he basically spoke to uh, basically having permanent organizations, something that you've kind of given the, the framework here um, for. Mm -hmm. um, are there other areas that you see um, where, so I'll put that question out, the same question, where, where are the cracks in the system uh, that we can uh, look to, that you see.
they, they don't like to talk about it. Uh, they, you know, and I, and I, I think they're selling themselves short uh, because the, the piece with getting the parents, uh, to, I mean, we've commandeered school buses to get kids, to get one kid to a ball game. I mean, you know, you know, everybody I'm sure has their own stories of crazy things that they've done in the school to help the kid out. Uh, and, I, and I really think that those are the, those, that's the glue that really starts to set to get the teachers and the families and the communities together. And for whatever reason, I don't know if it's humility or, or, or it's just like, no, 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 I don't want people to think that we're doing this. You know, they, they really don't put it out there mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form. I mean, you'll hear the negative comments in the paper, I'll finish with it, you'll hear all the negative comments coming out of the newspaper about the pensions, you know, they, they don't want to work an extra half hour every day because they're lazy and, you know, et cetera. And then, and then on the other hand, nobody wants to talk about them being there at night, making sure that the kids got eaten in the house, you know, making sure that the parents get a job sometimes. I mean, they, I, I, and I don't know how that gets done, uh, but, but I, I see it as being a real vacuum uh, that they have right now and because, because I think the ammunition is there, but I guess I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think they have to create it. I think, they're, I think they're already doing it. Uh, they, I, don't, I just don't think it's being possibly being coordinated uh, for the public. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. I guess that's my question follows your question is, uh, how can we involve parents in conversations with the schools and with the unions? I know as teachers we try to involve the parents as much as we can, but with unions I'm not so sure of what we do. So what can we do as a group to help? And I have a second question, which is, we have been talking a lot about the purpose of schools, purpose of schools, and um, sometimes we don't have an answer to the purpose of the schools. So what do you think is the purpose of schools today? What is the? The purpose? Oh, the purpose of education. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be more than three minutes. <laughs> okay, let me, let me take these on. They're all really big questions. Um, I think that the, um, let me go from the, the end. Um, you know, I'm going to bunch my answer to all some of these questions. Did you know the two reasons that people give for choosing teaching as a career? Two, the two most prevalent, the two most prevalent reasons: they love kids and they love their subject matter. And elementary school teachers overwhelmingly. You would ask them, why did you choose teaching as a career? They say, I love kids. And you always hear these stories of, oh, you know, ever since I can remember, I lined my dolls up and I taught them. You hear that all the time, right? Uh, the people who teach high school, more often it's, I really love English, I like kids, so I put the two together, and, you know, how am I going to support myself? How am I going to support myself being a historian? Right? So they become a social studies teacher. But they're not very political. Teachers as a group in this country are not very political. And in fact, that's probably true of teachers in the global north. They're not very political. Teachers in Latin America are more political. Teachers in Asia and Africa are more political. But teachers in this country and in the global north are not very political. But what has happened and is happening now is that conditions are worsening so rapidly, in particular, the tying of pay, of pay to test scores, that teachers are in an increasingly hostile environment in schools. Lots of teachers are frightened now. They're being harassed. They're being harassed, and they're frightened, and they feel no protection, and they're looking around for protection. You know what? The next step is for them to say, I need a union. But you know what? They already have a union. But it's not a union that's doing the job. So I think that what we are starting to see in this country is a mass radicalization of teachers. I think that's what we're beginning to see, is a mass radicalization of teachers. That's what BATS, you know, Badass Teachers Association, that's what BATS represents. A 
That's what it's about. It's this. I'm, I'm on that Facebook page as much as I can, and it's a very, very varied discourse, let me tell you. But people are angry. They're frightened and they're angry, and there are all kinds of questions about pedagogy and student learning objectives and student growth objectives and evaluation and common core. <coughs> Everything is up for grabs. Everything is up for grabs. So that would be part of my answer to the question that you asked Stanley. I think the two big movements right now are school closings and testing the anti-testing, the opt-out movement, and I think that they represent, they represent two sides of the same coin, but it's a racialized coin, because school closings affect poor students of color, and school testing is a demand, opting out of school testing is a demand primarily of white middle class parents and teachers. Because testing has a different meaning for poor parents of color. I'm not defending the standardized testing. I just want to say that. But it has a different meaning. Because if your kids attended a school where no learning occurred, and you didn't know that and you didn't know that no learning occurred, you want the test. Because the test is an objective measure of learning that occurred. And white middle class parents have to acknowledge that. And so do teachers. We have to acknowledge that. That's part of the slide of David W. Harlan. That's the legacy that we're working with here. And so I think that the testing movement has to be more race sensitive. And I think that white middle class parents who oppose the testing have to become involved in the school closing movement, and teachers who oppose school testing have to become involved in the school closing and charter co-location and all of those things, right? So those to me, that's the crack. That's the, we have two figures here, right? Because there's opposition. There's opposition. That's why, you know, that's why Diane Ravitch's book is, you know, in the news in the way that it is. That's why she got a review in the Sunday Times by Jonathan Kozel. Because, because of white middle class parents. That's what we have to understand. That's what we have to understand. And I think that the unions have to really be vigilant to make sure that the voices of parents of color are heard in this. Um, the other thing, now let me also address the fact that teachers don't understand the benefits of a union. Well, you know, the unions haven't been very good. They've mostly been about delivering your health insurance and giving you pension advice. And, and maybe representing you on a grievance. That's what they've been about. That's what it means to be a business union. So it's no accident that that's what they think that a union is because that's what the unions have been. And um, I also want to say this. Not everybody is going to be a union actor. And I think we have to realize that. Not everybody is going to be a union activist, and not everybody has to be a union activist. I'm not willing to say that every teacher has to be a union activist. What they have to do is they have to vote in a union election, right? They have to show solidarity in ways with their colleagues. They have to be part of a school community. Now, part of being a school community, I think, is inviting parents and students parents of younger students and students in middle school and high school to be part of the conversation of what school should look like. And elementary schools are typically less active in union than high school teachers. And that's a sign of a weak union. That's a sign of a very weak union. <coughs> when elementary schools are not represented. Because what it means is that the union is not speaking to what elementary school teachers care about. Remember what I said? Why, do, why are they going to teaching? Because they love the kids. And there's no rhetoric in teachers' unions about loving the kids. That's not part of the rhetoric today. The rhetoric is about pensions and pay. It's not about loving the kids. And we have to find a way to have unions talk about loving the kids. And what we do for the kids on our own. Now part of the reason 
that teachers don't want to talk about this, and this is drawn from feminist critiques. And an area of research, I know we have researchers here, an area of research that is really understudied is, is neoliberalism and gender. Neoliberalism's alterations in teachers' work and how that relates to gender. Almost nobody is studying this, and it's very, very important because historically, when cre uh, systems of, of mass public educate, well, you know, if you know the history, you know, women's true profession, teaching was women's true profession, blah, 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 blah. But teaching, the feminist analysis of teaching this work is that teaching is the work of parenting, that is mothering, done for a pay, for, for pay outside the home. So it has all of those contradictions because, you know, men work from sun to sun, a woman's work is never done, you know that? So in teaching, when are the kids' needs ever satisfied? You can always do more. It's not like you finish the Excel spreadsheet and you leave work at 7 o'clock. Your work is never done when you're a teacher. So teaching has these elements of mothering, of parenting. And we have to acknowledge that, and we can't, we shouldn't try to erase that. I think what we want to do is we want to make schools as organizations support those nurturing, those parenting functions. And I think that when unions fight for that, which is very hard to do within the confines of contracts, see? Contracts really limit us about what we can fight for. So that's one of the negatives. On the one hand, the contract gives us things that we need. On the other hand, the contract is limiting what we can fight for. And there is this tension here. There is a tension. We cannot, it is a dilemma. And we cannot escape that dilemma. Stanley has written some uh, interesting things about contract union, unionism. And we're actually seeing interesting things in Wisconsin since they got rid of collective bargaining. But what we're seeing is in Wisconsin, some of um, Michael Lapid's grad students have been studying this. There are these memorandum of understanding in Wisconsin that are really chilling. They return teaching. They return teaching and teachers' rights. It's practically like they're telling you again that you have to wear skirts below your knee. I want to tell you, those school boards, they are going to take away every right of teachers, every right of teachers with the loss of collective bargaining. So that's why, that gives me pause about what Stanley is saying about contract unionism, but on the other hand, he's absolutely right that it's limiting us. I, you know what, I don't have an answer, but it's a tension and I think that the Chicago Teachers Union has done a pretty doggone good job of mediating that tension, right? And I think the key is relations with parents, because parents can fight about things and you can support parents about things that are not in the contract. How do we reach out to parents? Well, you know what? Elementary school teachers have a lot of contact with parents. ESL and bilingual teachers often have a lot of contact with parents and community. ESL and bilingual teachers are very important cultural informants, and the union should be using them as such, as links to the community. They're very, very important. Okay. Oh, one, one last thing I want to say. The St. Paul Federation of Teachers has parents sit in on contract negotiations. Interesting. So there's an article in Labor Notes. Uh, last month ago. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there any more questions? So more questions. Oh, yes. Um, you had a question. Yeah. You mentioned Chicago public schools a few times. Yes. I think they closed about 50 public schools last year. Yes. And they're about to reopen about 40 or 50 charter schools. Yes, the TFA. Yeah, if you were around, I mean, Manuel, or if you were in charge of the public schools in Chicago, what would you do differently from what you're doing now? Okay. 
I'd like to make a comment. I'm very intrigued by the research you did regarding, especially with the World Bank report. I'm a guidance counselor in high school. And a few years back, the Fannie, I believe it was Fannie Mae report, put out some statistics that, and this was for 2014, mind you, that eight in 10 jobs in 2014 in Massachusetts would require a higher education degree. So I'm, if you can re, uh, address that afterwards in terms of this global project of how the um, education is, higher education is not needed and how it's a waste of money. Okay. Can I ask another question to the person? Sure. Another question. <laughs> Well, and, I mean, you also mentioned um, Duncan, and I personally don't think he did a great job in Chicago before he became. Right. He didn't do a great job back then. So if you were him, or even if you were advising Obama, the president, what would you tell him about public schools? What would be my program for public schools? Oh, what advice I mean, would you give Barack Obama mm -hmm. about his policies about public schools? <laughs> I, this is fascinating to me. Um, my mother, my whole family is full of teachers. And the district that I come from or grew up in has a very, has a very strong union. But the, the district I work in, um, the superintendent actually bragged to me on my interview that they haven't had a grievance in 17 years. They've been working there for four years, so now it's 21 years. Um, so whenever unions come up, for me, it's very abstract. Um, I don't even really understand you know, how, what this would look like. And the resistance usually at our school is, well, imagine if we had grievances. It would be absolutely awful. You know, the climate would change. But the thing that I think people don't notice and maybe we need to speak more about is in schools where there is a union but it's not active, is there's an underlying, it's a false utopia. Um, because we get asked to do things and we say yes. You know, when NIAS came into evaluate us, they were so impressed with how much time we put in extra. We actually went in the summer and didn't get paid for a full day of professional development. Um, and the presenters were like, oh my God, you're not getting paid on a summer day. They were, they were impressed. Um, but everyone starts to feel very resentful. And it's not even like they're being asked to do anything anymore. It's expected and you feel it just builds. And it creates a very mm -hmm. underlying toxic culture um, that you know goes unnoticed, but it definitely creates friction between the administration and the teachers. So, it's not really, I, I guess, do we build, is it true that we keep saying yes? You know, where are we kind of going down the road? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just wanted to add a little bit to a uh, comment about the 80% or what have you needing a college education. And I'm curious about the term in, in Massachusetts, there's been a lot of term of uh, talk about middle skilled employment. Uh, our governor's been very hot on this topic saying, that community college is so important because we need something between high school, but they're very clearly say uh, less than a four year degree. Right, yeah. Be it a one semester or one year certificate yeah. training for a job or an associate's degree, that seems to be the potential, the potential growth area is, at least in terms of uh, government. You had mentioned before that the test has an objective measure and how we need to address that. A lot of this opting out is through a white middle class perspective and not for um, minor, minorities that are majority parents. Um, these tests seem like something that's going to help make schools accountable. Um, how do, don't you think, though, that we need to address that rhetoric um, and to say that these are objective tests? Because, in fact, they're not objective and they're culturally biased. Um, so they're actually working against and standardizing knowledge and making sure the students have this technical. So what's worse? Being, you know, I just was at a um, radio show with a student that dropped out of New Bedford um, and went to Middle College or now Gateway College at BCC. And I told him, I said, dropouts or forced outs are actually more critical than the kids who got pushed through the system and did well on these tests or did just barely made it. And we were talking about this and I you know, he said that the resistance by having this system that was not working, that he felt, was probably more beneficial to him in the long run. I think that we 
bring in these tests and just pacify them and kind of sedate them in a way. Okay. Um, and, and the, so these are big questions. <clears throat> I, you know, what are the purposes of education? Gee, that's a discussion we have to have as a society. I can't answer that. I, I have a personal answer. I think uh, education is about, and I say it in the book, education is about um, educating. Purposes of education are to deepen democracy and improve, give people the capacity to live productive, uh, lives and contribute to the society. Uh, but what that looks like, we have to have a discussion. We have to have that discussion as a society and we have to have that discussion in communities. So if you would, if I would if I were giving uh, President Obama advice, I would say we have to have that discussion as a society. We have to make a dis we have to have a discussion as a society about whether we're going to make Preparing students for jobs, the most important function of education. Because that is not, to me, the most function, important function of education. And in fact, the, um, we have another reality here that we have to acknowledge, which is the credentialing function of school. And that is what that statistic is getting at. It's not the actual knowledge that's required in the job. It's the credential. So my daughter right now has a job that pays 15, she's a college graduate. I was just to other people, could be many others, not my own daughter, somebody else. She's a social worker. She graduated from Simmons. And she has a job now as a vocational rehab counselor. And she can't make a living because it's contracted out, and she can't make a living. She makes so little money that she qualifies for the child care supplement from the state of Massachusetts, in the state of Connecticut. She can't support herself. She has a BA from Simmons. Okay, the job of vocational, it requires a college education, but it's not paying a living wage. Somebody else, her, the, actually the same woman has two children living because her son has a BA and he's a manager at Walmart. He's a manager at Walmart. He's worked himself up to be a manager at Walmart. So now he's earning $12 an hour. But he has a BA. So Walmart is able to say, you need a BA to get a job at Walmart. But wait a minute. The job of being a manager at Walmart doesn't require the skills <coughs> to learn in higher education, right? So we have that the credential is being used to allocate scarce jobs. That's what's going on. The credential is being used to allocate scarce jobs. And you know what? That has been true in this country since the creation of public education, that it has had a credentialing function. And one of the things that I would say to President Obama we need a jobs policy in this country to create good jobs, well-paying jobs, safe jobs for everyone who wants one so that we don't have to ration jobs through credentialing. That's what we need. We have to unhook getting a job from getting a credential. That the bachelor's degree shouldn't be about a piece of paper you need to get a better paying job. The bachelor's degree should be about pursuing that knowledge. That's what it should be about. It should be about pursuing that knowledge, living a better life, finding out more about life. It shouldn't be about getting a job. So that's another thing that I would say. And we are over, and, and I'm, now I'm going to jump on another hobby horse I have, which is that increasingly in this pushback, people are saying poverty, poverty is the problem. Nobody is talking about the fact that the problem is jobs. The problem is the absence of jobs, and that's very important for us to say that is the problem and not poverty, because poverty brings to mind the other. 
especially the other, meaning people of color. And the demand I think that we need to make on President Obama and Arne Duncan is to acknowledge that education is not the true path out of, po out of poverty, which is what he said. Having a really good, well-paying job, having jobs that are available, even if they have to be created by the government, as was done during the Depression, that's the way out of poverty. That's my program for education. My program for education is jobs. That's my program for education. Good jobs, available, full employment for everyone, and then let's fund the schools. It's as simple as that. Very clear. Good jobs for everybody. Let's fund the schools adequately so that we can really help people to learn and love to learn and to be human, the human beings that we need in this globe. Let's do that. Let's fund that. And let's disconnect credentials from getting the job. So that's my program. And then in each community, we'll talk about what that curriculum would look like that would produce the citizens that we want and the people that we want. We'll have that discussion. I just want to go back to credentialing. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I found in my job search when I left my master's program was the credentialing piece, um, a master's of ed in counseling for the concentration counseling site. I couldn't get a job because the universities had created a credentialing strata. Um, so the social workers have all these licenses <coughs> that they push through the state level. So even though my education was as strong as theirs, and maybe I was sitting in the class with them, they went for a different license than I did, or I didn't go for a license, so I couldn't, I couldn't qualify for those better paying jobs. So the university has done it to itself in a lot of ways. That's right. That's exactly right. The, that's part of the story of mass public higher education, is the credentialing function of education in our society. But how do you back out of that now that you've created an entire industry around credentialing, which you and I are employed in? Well, how do we do that? Well, I think that, I don't think these changes are going to come, my own political sense here, is that these changes are not going to come within higher ed. That the, the evolution of this movement, okay, let me, let me just say this. Um, a sort of long answer. <clears throat> Part of the reason that teachers unions are being attacked in the way they are has to do with an, the issue of labor density, <clears throat> union density. And teachers throughout the world remain the segment of the economy with one of the highest proportions of union members. Know that? Mm -hmm. Everybody belongs to the union. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they have to. It's, it's sort of this, you know, it's sort of a profession, and, but there's a sense that you belong to the union, right? People, it's not hard to sign people up to become a union teachers. They join right away. So that is very dangerous that to employers and a financial, a powerful economic and political elite who want to destroy. Um, the rights of worker, workers to organize, see? And that's part of the reason that teachers and teachers unions are under this attack, because in many communities, the strongest union, the biggest and the strongest union, is the teachers union. That's true. I mean, you have the firefighters, you have the police, but the firefighters, there aren't as many firefighters as there are teachers. There are a whole lot more teachers, right? So that accounts for some of the uh, viciousness of the assault and the fact that teachers are fighting back in the way that they are. So I think strategically, we are going to see in the next couple of years, I think that we are going to see an increasing radicalization of pre-K-12 teachers. And we are going to see a change in the unions. That's what I'm making the prediction right now. The, there's a 
There are battles. I'm telling you, and again, you don't see this in the media. In Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, a slate has formed for an election in the teachers' union. It is the second largest teachers' union in the world. And I think the reform slate, progressive reformers, are going to win. And they're winning by mobilizing about school closings and about the schools LA students deserve. I think we're going to see them in April. I think in April they're going to win. Uh, Newark, New Jersey, teacher signed this awful contract negotiated by the National AFT. Terrible. Ta so bad. So bad. And, and a small opposition caucus that was 12 people when I talked to them in October won, in the, won a majority on the union executive board in April and lost the presidency by seven votes. That's in the Newark, New Jersey schools, with a pretty big turnout from teachers, 40%. I'm going to make a prediction that if Providence, in Providence, if the teachers do, if they continue, um, that within three years, you're going to see a progressive new union leadership in Providence. I, it, it's happening all over, because you've been teaching for eight or nine years, you support a family, you can't afford to lose your job because of these crappy evaluations tied to test scores, right? It's, 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 it's your livelihood, not only the dignity of your profession, it's your livelihood. And people have union density. So they have a union, but they don't have good unions. So I'm predicting that there is going to be a pushback. And that pushback is going to allow us to talk about all of these things, and that's my gripe with Diane Ravage, is that she doesn't talk about all these things. Ravage gives an answer that is essentially a return to what we had in the 50s. That's her answer. We had good schools in the 50s. The only problem was poverty in the society. I don't think we had good schools in the 50s. I don't think we did. And this movement gives us in this room an opportunity to rethink all of these things. I don't have all the answers, but that's our that's our opportunity now. So I think we have to have